Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special CIO Executive Council Power Hour Twittercast. My name is Tim Scannell, and I'm Director of Strategic Content for the CIO Executive Council. And today, we're going to be focusing on the topic of customer centricity and the tools and tactics that make it work for an organization. But before we dive into that, I think it's important to understand just what is meant by the term customer centricity. For one, it goes way beyond the concept that a customer is always right, a phrase believed to be first used in 1909 by Harry Selfridge, a visionary retailer who founded a department store that bears his name and whose efforts were the focus of a PBS series. Today, customer centricity is not simply providing great customer service. It consists of providing a memorable and useful customer experience from that initial touch point right on through the purchasing process and subsequent follow-up to keep that customer relationship alive. In terms of importance to the whole digital transformation effort in companies today and the creation of a digital culture, customer centricity is right there on top of the list based on custom research from Carinium Intelligence. In a true customer-centric culture, a company's structure, their work methods, communications channels, and collaborative networks all come together to, to the point where customer awareness and empathy become a natural byproduct, a passion to do the right thing, both for the individual and the company. Companies recognize the importance of customer centricity as they shift from a product and service-based mentality to one that cent centers on genuine customer needs and desires as noted in this chart presented recently by IDC at its directions briefing in Boston and on the West Coast. They're investing more in customer-centric solutions and people skilled in this area. Customer engagement may seem to be a people-oriented process, but in reality, in today's world of social media and pervasive connectivity to worldwide sources and opinions, customer engagement is a blend of human contact and digital solutions. As noted in the graph, technology tools and advancements allow for faster and more accurate research, not only of products, but vendors and manufacturers as well. Customers choose buying channels based on convenience, need, and urgency. Brand may take a backseat to filling that need quickly and fast. Advancements in AI, machine learning, voice recognition, and other areas will provide faster response times to customer queries, while data analytics will blend with social media tools to offer a more customized and personal experience. However, this experience may be one-dimensional if they are not used intelligently and judiciously, and not at the expense of the human element in that relationship. There are challenges ahead, especially in terms of creating effective and more customer-focused internal cultures and interacting with a myriad of external forces, both technological and strategic. Among the challenges noted in this graph is the belief that there is no common de definition for customer centricity. What works for one company may not work for another. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. And this is just one of the many points we'll talk about today in this webcast. At this point, I'd like to introduce the moderator of this discussion, Martha Heller, who is one of the most widely followed voices on the role of the CIO, as well as a leading columnist in CIO.com. Martha is also the author of two books on IT leadership, produces a very informative weekly newsletter, The Heller Report, and is the CEO of Heller Search Associates. If that isn't enough, she's also a founding member of the CIO Executive Council. I believe there's also a statue of Martha somewhere in the IDC, IDG campus here in Framingham. Uh, welcome, Martha. And joining Martha today, uh, Vijay Sankaran, CIO at TD Ameritrade, and Steve Betts, SVP and CIO at Healthcare Service Corporation, a member-owned health insurance company. Before I turn over the keys to the webcast to Martha, I'd like to remind you that in keeping with the theme of customer centricity, you are the customer out there. And I'd like to remind you that everything on this session is being presented on a very interactive platform. So please, tweet questions, tweet observations uh, during the webcast. Uh, we'll try to get as many of you, those things as they come over uh, as possible. And now I turn it to Martha. 
Thank you so much, Tim. I am surprised but overjoyed to learn about this statue and hoping that it can help me uh, to run my business. That would be <laughs> terrific. So <clears throat> I just want to uh, uh, welcome everyone uh, to, to today's session and to start us off with a few uh, opening comments. So I have spent the last 20 years asking CIOs a number of questions. And for the last 12 months, that question has been, what does digital mean to your company? This is what they're telling me. We used to use technology to run our business. Now technology is our business. We used to sell a product. Now we sell data or connectivity or customer experience. We used to know who our competitors were. Now our competitors are coming at us from all sorts of new places. As a company, we used to be all about manufacturing or supply chain or R&D or design. And now we are all about the customer. And the customer wants access on her phone, on her watch, through her voice, through her shoes. I just talked to the chief digital officer of Under Armour, uh, where they're doing sensors in shoes. Uh, she wants access in her car. Uh, for me, I say I'm looking forward to when you can just go straight to my brain, right? <laughs> let's, let's get past all of these extremities and just let's go straight to the brain. But here's the rub. Customer centricity is a pretty word, and I do think it's a pretty word. It's a sort of a mellifluous, lots of alliteration. It's a pretty word. But for most companies, and this alludes to the, one of the slides you mentioned, Tim, it's a monumental change. Uh, it isn't get a better CRM system or put artificial intelligence in the call center. It is a complete overhaul in the way we think and work. It involves the choices you make in your data center, your architecture, your development processes, in the people you hire and in the tools you give them. It means moving from project management to product management. It means moving from giving IT the order to putting IT right on the marketing team so that they can co-create together. It involves everything from your CEO's changing his or her understanding of the company's place in the value chain all the way down to your teleconferencing system. From my vantage point, working with many different companies across many different industries, and I'm sorry to be so dour at the beginning of a, of a, of a conversation, some companies are going to make the shift to customer centricity, and some are not. Uh, I, we were kicking off a CIO cert several months ago for a large bank, and I asked the CEO, tell me about what you're doing with the outgoing CIO is doing with Agile. And he said, ugh, Agile, that's another buzzword. And I thought, oh, you're going to be out of business in 10 years. <laughs> I didn't articulate that because, you know, I wanted to get the search. But, um, but, but so what separates the, the winners from the losers? What separates the companies that are able to reimagine everything they do from the CEO's vision to branding to procurement to IT? What separates them from the people who are not going to be able to make that change? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm very delighted to have Steve Betts, who's the CIO of Healthcare <clears throat> Service Corporation, and Vijay Sankaran, who is the CIO of TD Ameritrade. Uh, and I have to warn everybody here, we're going to figure this out. We're not going to leave until we do. I'd like to put, I can't really put locks on your doors because, you know, you're not here. But uh, we gotta, we're going to figure out this whole centricity thing before we leave this afternoon. So uh, I'd love to start, Vijay, with you. Can you just tell us a little opening about uh, TD Ameritrade you, and your role there? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Martha, and thanks for uh, having me on this panel. Um, so TD Ameritrade is one of the largest online brokers um, in the United States. Um, we are we have two parts to our business. One is our self-directed retail client. They basically go on to our digital properties. Uh, they invest on our digital properties. Um, there's a number of different services that we offer. And then we have a thriving institutional business where we actually provide technologies for registered investment advisors, and they leverage our platforms to serve their clients. Um, so we are truly a digital first business. We do have physical uh, presence in terms of a number of branches that we have around the United States, but it is all in, in support of a digital first uh, strategy around self-directed uh, investors in our RAs. 
Okay, thank you. And I'm just going to stick uh, with you for one uh, second. Uh, can you uh, just give us an example of a product, a solution, or a tool that really epitomizes or exemplifies your digital first uh, uh, focus? Yeah, so uh, it's hard to pick one, Martha, but um, I would say that uh, one that's very interesting is a product that we have called have called Bayo One. It's on our institutional side of the business. And what mm -hmm. makes it so interesting and why it's customer centric and digital first is that we have a variety of investment advisors who use our, uh, our technology, but they also use other technologies. So they may use Salesforce to manage their interrela interrelationships with their clients. They may use Orion for their portfolio modeling and balancing. And so when they came to TD Ameritrade, they said, we don't want to give up all these tools to use your tools. And so we actually built uh, an ecosystem called open access around all, us and all of these technology vendors and we became the single pane of glass uh, for our investment advisors and we said use the tools that fit with your business processes use the tools that you're comfortable with and we'll be the integrator in terms of the veo one portal for all of you so that really exemplifies it and and across all of our platforms that's a, a perspective that we've taken is that really client centric uh, vision and creating a superior client experience. Great. Thank you very much. Steve, same question to you. Overview and then uh, an example of something that you would say uh, exemplifies your focus on customer centricity. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, thanks for the opportunity to uh, join you here today. Uh, up front, one of the things you'll, you'll hear me refer to our customers often as members. Um, so I'll use those terms uh, interchangeably. So. I'm sure many of the, the uh, folks tuning in have not heard of HCSC. Uh, you probably have heard of Blue Cross Blue Shield. So you know, HCSC is the largest member-owned uh, health insurer in the country and the fourth largest overall. Uh, we operate Blue Cross Blue Shield plans in five states, so Illinois, Montana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. Uh, we serve more than 16 million members across those uh, five states. And we administer uh, about $75 billion uh, per year uh, in healthcare services and, and goods uh, uh, you know, in, across, those, uh, across our plans. Uh, for me, you know, my role as, as CIO, I have uh, you know, responsibility across all the technology, also uh, our enterprise data uh, and analytics. And um, you know, I've been you know, uh, driving solutions, but as you mentioned up front, uh, really partnering with our business leaders to, uh, you know, to chart a path uh, towards becoming more, uh, you know, digital, um, digital first and more customer centric. Uh, I wouldn't say we're, we're as far uh, dedicated as, uh, as VJ in terms of that, uh, that, that um, you know, digital uh, mindset, uh, but of our top three priorities of our CEO, Paula Steiner, you know, one of them is uh, that we're a tech-enabled uh, company with technology and data at the forefront um, as part of our uh, as part of our strategy. Uh, one of the examples that I would uh, highlight uh, is you know, a lot of our solutions are delivered through our, our mobile app, so we're very much a uh, uh, centered on mobile, supported with a, uh, an ecosystem and APIs. So we have something we call health advocacy solutions. Uh, that's all about uh, connecting uh, all of the data we have uh, for our members and providing advice to them uh, on whatever their next best action is within the healthcare system at any touch point that we have, whether that's voice, whether that's digital and, uh, and, and, and so forth. So uh, yeah, that advocacy solution really what we I call advanced customer engagement, which is really a way of bringing that intelligence into uh, every interaction. And then, you know, one thing I'll, I'll add just for me, you know, it, it, when I think of digital, uh, having a, a real robust, you know, microservices and API uh, architecture uh, is fundamental to that. And, 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 you know, we're increasingly seeing our clients uh, consume, our employer clients consuming our APIs to make data uh, for their employees available through their, uh, you know, through their employee uh, portals in their own context. So I think, uh, you know, having that uh, ubiquitous connectivity through that kind of, uh, you know, services model 
uh, is also one of the core elements of our strategy. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Vijay, when you and I have talked in the past, you also talked about microservices as being foundational to having a digital-first, customer-centric uh, vision and uh, experience. Uh, you know, is that easy, right? One day you're not using microservices and the next day you are? Or is it a challenge in your IT organization to get your team who's been thinking about uh, more traditional technologies to th start thinking architecturally different? How have you, VJ, been able to create a culture in IT that can really rethink architecture along, for example, a microservices uh, uh, structure? That's a great question, Martha. And I mean, I think for us, um, the catalyst was that word you used earlier, which was agile. And um, so we made a conscious decision as a company about two and a half years ago to go fully agile, um, you know, for a digital company. Uh, I was concerned that, you know, we, when I took over a CIO, that we were still very much uh, a waterfall type shop. And so over the last two and a half years, we've restructured uh, all of our software engineering teams to be agile, where we're all over 85% uh, agile in terms of all of our development population. We've doubled our throughput in terms of um, delivering value to our business. And as part of that journey, what I think the teams have discovered is a desire to release even more quickly. And part of the um, biggest impediment in releasing more quickly is what's called a monolith application. So you have to go through extensive testing, it's not, uh, there's, there's not a lot of unit, code, uh, unit test code on it. And so we've said microservices really is the catalyst to allow teams to release more frequently, break down those monoliths. Uh, we've partnered with Pivotal to bring in Cloud Foundry, which is a containerization platform um, that allows us to uh, really break these applications down into smaller pieces, uh, recombine them in different ways. Uh, reuse APIs across the ecosystem and release a lot faster. So Agile for us was the real catalyst in terms of the shift in mindset. The other catalyst was um, we began to uh, expose a lot of our core capabilities um, just beyond our own ecosystem to you know third parties like Facebook and Amazon and Twitter. So uh, that's also been a really exciting part of our strategy. So, Steve, I'm going to flip this back to you. Uh, you know, some of the things that VJ is talking about, you know, agile development, microservices, you know, APIs, all of that, uh, you know, that's going to be very exciting uh, to a certain segment of your IT organization. Others are going to say, boy, that's a lot of change to what end? So, you know, real transformation to customer centricity involves the connection of the big vision. Why are we doing this? What does this mean to our customers? What does this mean to our company? All the way down to an architectural change like uh, one to microservices. How are you and your executive colleagues in your organization at HCSC connecting what's happening on the ground, all this innovation in the technology organization to that big vision that's focused on the customer or in your, in your instance on the member? Yeah, so a um, uh, couple of uh, the, uh, perspectives to that and yeah, remarkable uh, listening to Vijay's uh, answer could have delivered exactly the same, even down to the technology. So, uh, yeah, a lot of common themes there. And two things, Martha, I would say. One is, yeah, we've developed a, a very robust view of customer journeys and my, within that, micro journeys. And looking at our business through our members' eyes and, uh, you know, looking at, you know, what does a good experience look like? What does a good outcome look like? Um, across uh, that dimension um, has been tremendously powerful in cutting through traditional silos. So, you know, many companies you know, like ours are structured in, uh, from a functional perspective, often each having their own definition of applications they want to have and customer or member facing uh, assets that they have. Flipping that around to a, a, a member journey centric model um, has helped us, has cut through that because, you know, as a member-owned company, we are very, very focused on, uh, on driving those member, uh, member experience and, and outcomes. So, uh, you know, that's led to um, much more of a, uh, 
you know, a matrixed uh, set of, uh, you know, matrix governance and set of stakeholders. Uh, uh, leading into uh, the second element that I would highlight is that we pivoted to uh, a product-centric model. I think you may have mentioned that in your, uh, in your upfront comments. And so, you know, having uh, products with uh, business product owners, with IT product owners, um, and then building that prioritized backlog based on those multiple stakeholders, uh, building out the what we call the width of the road in terms of the number of Scrum teams uh, based on the the pace desired and the uh, uh, and the you know the extent of the backlog is how we then deliver on that using the uh, you know the, the, the you know, primarily uh, the pivotal um, uh, stack as well uh, using that agile model. In fact, we've uh, yeah we've we've used um, we adopt the extreme programming. Uh, technique from Pivotal for our, our digital assets uh, with more of a, a you know a, a, a Scrum Agile model um, uh, you know for, for the for the rest of the uh, the the, the, the uh, estate uh, and then one other thing which I can uh, just touch on Martha to, to try and keep it brief as you know as, as we've talked about in the past I've embedded our members of my team in each part of the business. So uh, we have a mantra of be the business. Uh, they, you know, think of them as, as you know, divisional functional CIOs uh, with a core group, and that's actually where the, 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 the product management layer sits. And then we have a central, uh, really a software engineering group that forms the scrum teams that then support that. And that's the way we get uh, that, that partnership, that technology driving business, business driving technology together um, in each of the business areas. So those are all great examples of, uh, you know, removing the silo between, uh, you know, IT and, quote, the business. And in fact, I thought I saw, Tim, in one of the slides that, that you had put up there that one of the greatest impediments to customer centricity is the persistence of silos, right? We've been running our businesses the same way since, I don't know, the early 19th century, where we would do walls around our companies and walls between our uh, departments because we needed to swim in our lanes. We need to be, to be specialized. Now the culture is shifting where it's all about co-creation, cross-functional collaboration. So my question to you, VJ, is you know, you've been digital first for a while. So you're on sort of the other side of this where you've got a nice, you know, co-creation cross-functional culture happening. Uh, how have you been able to do that? What was the challenge to removing those silos and getting to that happy cross-functional state that Steve describes? What was the, cha what, what was the primary challenge in getting that to the point and how, how were you able to overcome it? Yeah, I mean, I think our journey is very similar to Steve in many ways. Um, I think, you know, uh, Agile was actually started by the technology organization because we felt like we needed to be closer to our partners um, in the digital-centric businesses to drive value a lot faster. And in, in many ways, they were very excited about it because, you know, quite frankly, I think they felt that IT was slow up to that point in terms of delivering value. Um, but, you know, as time has gone on, you know, we, we have really been very focused on teaching people in technology about the agile practices on, you know, uh, things like extreme programming, test-driven development, behavior-driven development, uh, continuous refactoring, uh, being able to do daily stand-ups. And to some degree, I would say our partners in the business have lagged a little bit around some of that maturity. And so um, what some of the things that we're working on right now uh, are really teaching our, our product partners around things like road mapping, doing program increment planning, uh, running quarterly portfolio reviews around looking at their investments holistically, prioritizing uh, value based upon uh, what they're going to get from each of these features, how to move teams around to apply them to the right problems. Um, so there's a maturity level just around uh, not just building faster, but also building the right thing. Uh, and then how do you infuse innovation into that journey? So how do you really think about um, bringing up new ideas and how do you cultivate those ideas and then feed them into uh, an agile team so that they can you know, bring an MVP to market within three months of the idea being 
uh, validated. So we're actually doing now a lot more of a hybrid cross between innovation processes and our agile processes, and it's really a nice fit. Um, it's it's going to be a lot of fun to see that um, evolve. So I think the maturity um, of our lines of business has been probably the biggest challenge because, you know, they assume that Agile is an IT thing. Uh, I think historically they felt that product creation um, is, is, is it's IT in the business, but I think in this new digital-centric world, it's all one. And so I think just that cultural uh, uh, adapting is, is what's been, you know, the biggest change effort that we have in place right now. You know, I appreciate that comment because for the longest time we've said to uh, CIOs, you know, you can't talk tech with the business. You know, you have to leave the bits and bytes at the door and focus on their business goals and then, you know, gingerly bring in <laughs> the conversation of technology. But today when businesses really are technology businesses, I don't think the business has the luxury anymore of uh, not understanding more. You know, a business leader should understand what a microservice is. A business leader should understand what an API is, and a business leader should uh, show up to be agile because, uh, you know, it takes two to be agile, and if it's only IT showing up, don't bother. So I think this notion of, you know, yes, be the business, and Steve, you and I share that that's your, your one of your sort of mottos for your organization, and that's the title of my last book, but I think increasingly, you know, the business needs to be IT. Do you feel that when it comes to your, your teams that are focused most specifically on, you know, customer-facing products, that, this is a question to you, Steve, has the maturity level, to use uh, Vijay's phrasing, has it improved? Uh, you know, are your business leaders understanding that technology is their business and they have a degree of education that they need to do? Yeah, I've seen, I've really seen that, 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 uh, shift over the last uh, few years and um and you know part of that is leadership from the top so you know paula steiner our, our ceo you know making it one of her top three pillars send a strong message to the leadership team and, all, and, and the whole company and so you know what i found is is really at, at multiple levels from a from a strategy perspective as we're looking at you know what are the strategic drivers for our business uh, technology and the use of data, advanced analytics, AI, are significant uh, drivers, along with uh, other emerging uh, technologies in the, the field of uh, genomics, uh, you know, sensors, wearables, uh, you know, virtual experiences for healthcare. Like the list, list goes on, and you can really see that transforming how healthcare works and our role in it, uh, and it amplifies the uh, the, the member centric. Uh, elements of the strategy. So I think it's it's become very much a, a narrative and awareness as we're developing our strategy across the whole team. Obviously, I'm a big voice there, and but uh, uh, it, it's so I've really seen it it change there. I have seen it also change on the as, as how we deliver. I will say that you know like, like VJ, we were the the agile transformation was was driven from from my team, which we uh, we rebranded out of. Uh, from IT to health tech, which better kind of captured more of a, uh, a business-centric, innovative uh, um, element. Um, but it was, you know, that, that's that been a journey. I'd say we're still maturing in that journey of genuinely not having it feel like you've got to stop doing your day job to, you know, to participate in an IT thing. Uh, and really embrace it as a key element of your role that's a big part of, of, of your success. Uh, we we we're, we we moved to that model pretty quickly on the the very heavy um, you know digitally enabled capabilities, to customer service, or the digital uh, heavy areas. In other areas, less so, and that's something that we're uh, that we're still uh, maturing. And then you know the one other area which I'll maybe tee up here and happy to drill into it uh, in a subsequent question if you'd like is I established a an incubator within my organization uh, in 2016. And I set it up purposefully as an incubator that would serve the enterprise, but you know, would, uh, would be, be run uh, out of my team. And you know, that's been uh, a real engine for, for cultivating uh, ideas. Uh, it's where we've really embedded a design thinking 
approach into innovation. And I think similar to VJ, we've started bringing that, those approaches more out into the mainstream now. You know, we've seen concepts come in there with what we thought was the best idea since, since sliced bread. When you test it with actual members that are going to interact with that solution, you quickly uh, revolve, you know, change the concept through to, to prototype and so forth. So, you know, that's been an area of tremendous partnership uh, across the you know, traditional business teams and the, uh, the technology and, and data analytics teams. Excellent. So I'm going to ask VJ one more question, and then, Tim, I know you have a question from the audience. Yes, uh, VJ, uh, you know, uh, what Steve talked about is, you know, when you do a minimal vi viable product and you put it into production on a small scale, you know, as, as an incubator, uh, that's when you learn whether or not it can really scale. Well, you know, in financial services, I think the concept of smart failure traditionally has, has been a, uh, an oxymoron, right? You know, we're dealing with high volume transactions here. Failure is probably not something that your, your board or your CEO loves uh, to contemplate, yet we all know that the concept of fast failure or smart failure has to be a part of innovation. How have you been able to educate your executive team so they become more comfortable with, with that kind of a culture where we're going to fail before we succeed? How have you gone about uh, that kind of influence? Well, I like to use the word learnings instead of failures, <laughs> and maybe that helps diffuse them a little bit, right? So um, I think there are good places to test and learn and there are not so good places to test and learn in financial services. So if you think about our business, our clients you know, will typically place a trade or make an investment and then it gets processed by the street and an order gets filled and things like that. So as it relates to like order management, the, um, the robustness of fulfilling an order, the time sensitivity of pricing, those are all places that you can't take a lot of risks, right? And we have extensive APIs and testing and things built out around that backbone. But where you can take risks is on the edge. And so one of the things, Martha, I know you and I have talked about is this notion of digital 2.0, which is where you know there are a number of emerging interfaces, whether it's through Amazon Alexa or Twitter or Facebook or Apple Business Chat um, or inside of a vehicle. And we're, we're on all of these channels where we're experimenting to see so that we can be uh, wherever our clients want us to be, anywhere, anytime, on any device. And so, uh, and I don't know which of those devices a client will end up picking. Um, we don't know uh, if you know Twitter will be the right channel for uh, application interaction. We don't know if Facebook will be the right one. So we recognize that there's some degree of experimentation, and we may have to sunset some of those things. Um, but we know that these are all macro level customer trends that we have to be where our customers are in order to be successful over time. Some will stick, some, some will retire, um, and some will learn from. And I think that's all part of a, a product life cycle mindset that you know we need to really embrace going forward in order, because we don't know exactly where our customers are going to want to be. I mean, so much is written about the millennials and things like that, but you know, do we actually know how they're going to be in their 30s and their 40s? We, we actually don't. So we have to keep experimenting, and where those where we get stickiness, we amplify and lean into those efforts. I have. I, we could just have a conversation just on what you just said alone for another two hours, but I'm going to I'm going to pause and Tim uh, tell us a question that our uh, esteemed audience has has asked us. All right, thank you, Martha. We do have a question. Uh, our, our viewer notes that it, while it's important for everyone to be more customer centric and customer aware, uh, we can't forget that ROI is critical. Uh, so he's wondering: Is there a process or metrics to measure customer centricity, even if you can't identify it at this point? Okay, Steve, why don't we start with you? How are you measuring customer centricity or satisfaction? Well, I guess customer centricity is, is what we're talking about. How do you measure that? <clears throat> customer centricity, so I would, I would, it's not how we describe our metric. I'd say that the, uh, you know, the key mechanism we use is the net promoter score. Um, and we also have a concept of customer effort, uh, which, we, which we measure. And on the net promoter score, there are multiple la layers to that. So you know, I instituted a net promoter score, 
actually for what's now health tech for my team uh, on how are we doing across our business areas, which uh, you know has, has been you know a great platform for us to have a dialogue with how we're doing and how we can uh, uh, improve. And uh, we started low, but we've had some some big improvement over the last few years. Uh, we then have a, a customer. We have a, a, a an MPS score um, for us at our client level. So we have uh, you know, a lot of our clients are large employer groups with uh, with their employees, uh, and then we also have uh, two types of of net promoter score uh, at the member level. Uh, one is is more of a um, uh, a transaction level, so you know, as we're you're you've just completed a, a, a transaction, you know, how did you feel about this? So more of kind of a point in time, and then other uh, more the traditional uh, MPS, you know, would you recommend our services to a, a to a, a you know a, a, a friend? And um, so that's that's been the the primary mechanism. Uh, customer effort is a uh, is an interesting uh, one that that we measure in our customer service area. Uh, that takes into account uh, uh, the interaction of that member across multiple channels, and um, you know how hard was it for them uh, to get to the information uh, that we that we need. So we're looking at touch points, we're looking at uh, at the time on the phone. We use uh, uh, you know technologies um, such as ClaraBridge to uh, you know to take uh, voice to text and do analytics on the uh, on the calls that, that that we have. So there's a number of factors that come into uh, uh, into that measure. So I so say those are the uh, those are the primary uh, metrics that we have in that space. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you on this in a second. VJ, how are you measuring customer centricity? I, I mean, I would say uh, it sounds like Steve and I have very similar practices you around just... how things are done. I mean, the overriding metric is net promoter score, and we have you know like a digital uh, net promoter score as well in terms of you know specifically how our clients. Um, See the you know the the efficiency and effectiveness of our digital platforms, but then we break that down into we get survey feedback. So I would say there's there's a couple of, of, of feedback points that we have for clients. Clients will either tell us a this information feels clunky or b um, you know the, that that uh, the flow feels clunky. So we get a lot of uh, feedback data, and what we do is. We actually run a lot of that feedback data through an artificial intelligence engine to understand um, like key pain points that our, our clients are having, and then we prioritize those as part of the digital backlogs of the different teams. Um, also, similar to uh, Steve, you know, we have digital service, so we have what, what are called our client irritants or call drivers, and um, so if there are forms, for example, that they have to do. Uh, in a paper way, you know, we'll prioritize those in the digital service model and build APIs to drive straight through processing so they can have that self-service. Um, so we have, I think there's a lot of similarity in terms of um, how how we measure effectiveness in terms of, of client connection. The other thing that we do is, you know, when new ideas come to bear, we, we really try to unpack what those new ideas are going to do for our clients before we actually will put them into an agile sprint and bring them to market. So like if I were to introduce a new feature, right, um, what exactly, who are the clients that are going to use that feature? Why do we need that feature? So I'm a big proponent of uh, Simon Sinek's book, starting with why. Uh, it's a question that we ask a lot of everything that we do is why are we doing what we're doing, right? Why do we exist, right? And so um, I think by utilizing that as sort of our North Star, you know, we've really been able to focus on the client experience. So just following up on that, and then I'm going to turn. I know we have another question, Tim. I'll turn to you. <clears throat> the way we used to measure our IT team's performance uh, was on, you know, mean time to recovery, uh, uptime, right? We would measure IT activity. Well, IT activity is important, and it's important, it's important to measure it. But as we're becoming customer-centric organizations, many of these metrics that both of you have talked about 
uh, those can make their way into the way we're assessing the performance of our IT team. And as we all know, a compensation plan is a behavioral plan. So the more uh, metrics that we're using to assess and bonus our IT teams, the more those are the same customer-centric metrics and measurements that the CEO and chief marketing officer hold dear, uh, the more we're going to have the whole organization moving toward that culture of centricity. So uh, just sticking with you, VJ, have you been able to change the uh, performance uh, uh, you know, criteria for your team, incorporating some of these uh, more digitally oriented or, or customer uh, metrics? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, so first of all, I think about it as for our clients, system availability and system uptime, that's like table stake, right? So um, it is still actually the biggest driver of um, net promoter scores if the systems are down, right? So when the systems are up, everybody is uh, feels good when the systems are down. Uh, you know, our call center volumes go up. Um, it affects our overall firm-wide compensation in terms of service levels and stuff like that. So so we don't take our, our eye off the ball of systems resiliency. It's still uh, something that we put a, a tremendous amount of focus. Beyond that, you know, what we're really trying to do is in the Agile model, we want our uh, product owners to take a lot of ownership for the product and being the voice of the customer, right? Because really... They're the ones that should be amassing product feedback. They should be collecting input from the different stakeholders in the business operations area. And so what we actually measure our teams a lot on is just the value that they're able to deliver based upon different features and stories. And so um, by looking at that and also how quickly they're able to deliver those on those teams with a throughput of the teams, um, we actually measure uh, successful and less successful teams based upon uh, throughput and value metrics. Excellent. Thank you. Steve, how about you? How are you incorporating some, quote, business metrics into your IT organization's performance? Yeah, so, um, you know, you mentioned something earlier about us, uh, you know, teaching the, the terminology to the, to the business. And one interesting one is API. So to, to many folks, API is the annual performance incentive. Uh, also, the application programming interface, and I'm proud to say that we uh, are bilingual now. So we have APIs for APIs, and um, so we, you know, we it, it, within that matrix structure that I that I talked about, the you know the individuals that are uh, aligned with the the business areas um, have aligned incentives. So there's uh, you know there's there's an, an outcome based alignment there. Um, across the matrix of the uh, of, of the organization, um, I think that the you know that's that's the, the primary one in terms of how it really comes down to comp. But similar to to, to VJ, we have developed a uh, you know very robust set of enterprise metrics that cover uh, velocity, predictability, quality um, at the uh, the function delivery, the kind of the epic. Uh, level all the way down to a, a story level within a product, and we're tracking those at a an enterprise level, at a business area level, all the way down to an individual team level, whether they're our uh, employee teams or third party teams. So it's been a you know a, a, a really um, you know incredible tool to have data drive the conversation. Um, and also, you know, have some some conversations about what I talked about earlier with the quality of that that business to, to technology team interaction, which is obviously where you sometimes see you know the backlog getting a little thin or or the leading indicators that that help uh, manage performance. So, you know, probably more on the the operational performance side than the financial performance side of the whip and some of that. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Tim, what is our next question? Well, it's sort of a follow-up to the, um, the data-driven side, the data analytics uh, piece that's used inside customer, uh, finding out what a customer wants. Um, the viewer notes that uh, Steve earlier talked about embedding people and, and eliminating silos within the organizations so you can bring collaborative teams together. Um, but wants to know, is, is there still a need for that gut-feeling approach out there? You know, someone who is really experienced and just 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 knowing what the customer wants. And if that's so, uh, is it a marketing responsibility, or do we need a customer relations officer or person as part of the organization? So I'm I'm just going to comment on that for a second. 
you know, every time, this is very obnoxious for me to say, every time we have a problem, we hire a new chief, right? We got a <laughs> chief customer officer, chief digital officer, chief innovation officer, and, you know, when does the executive committee look completely different? So the question is, uh, Vijay, starting with you, do you have a chief customer officer? That's the question, right, correct? Yeah. Do you have a chief customer officer, and, and, and what are your thoughts on that concept of a functional person, somebody who's responsible for the customer? Yeah, I, I mean, we don't have a chief customer officer, and, but, we, you know, our number one strategic priority for the firm is to create a superior client experience. So it's implicit that each of our business units needs to embrace that as uh, a primary focus. And those leads are measured and compensated based upon creating a superior client experience. And there are measurements like net promoter scores and other things that are, are part of that incentive, right? And so I prefer the model where, you know, we want a, a business unit that has a PL to really drive those strategies from uh, you know the enterprise. And then you know I think where there are opportunities across business units or across lines of businesses, typically you know our CEO has asked me to take an active role in terms of that you know more unified digital experience across different um, different areas. So uh, you know I, don't, I I feel like when you create those sorts of positions at the Sea level, it actually creates some level of friction between those individuals and the individual business unit because you know you might have strategies, a person coming in articulating strategies that don't really fit within the business unit because of you know certain operational reasons or maturity or things like that. So you know, I I like to say, hey, let's put put people in the, in those roles to manage and lead business units who see the full picture, not just, you know, one part of the puzzle. So I'm going to actually shift uh, uh, and talk about talent. Um, you know, what I'm finding is, you know, when we are recruiting people who report into the CIO, we need, you know, business knowledge and influence and relationship building and all of that. Uh, but they also have to be deep technologists who have... Uh, you know, uh, architectural knowledge and the ability to do all of this. And the two of you sitting here, I don't think we could, you know, swap you out with a utility executive from marketing or supply chain or uh, corporate functions who could sit here and lead an IT team focused on um, uh, APIs and whatnot, you know, what I'm finding is a real, and this I swear is not just my chance to complain about my job, I swear, but what I'm finding is a real tightening now in the market for these wonderful superhuman creatures, you know, who can do all of this. So starting with you, Steve, you know, you've talked about portfolio teams, right, and the way that you organize. Well, those portfolio teams are incredibly important, to both for vertical and horizontal uh, technology and business enablement. So quick question to you, what are those portfolio teams? Because those are critical to your operating model. And what are the what's the blend of, of leadership or, or, or skills that you're that you're requiring for those leaders? Yeah, absolutely. So they you know these portfolio teams are uh, those those members of my team that are embedded into our lines of business and, and our functions. So they're really matrixed members of those business areas. And you know, think of it as a mini CIO, but also uh, delivery leaders, you know, business solution leaders, business architects, uh, business analysts, uh, the product uh, product managers are, are in there as well, and they have, uh, you know, they have to, to cover across, you know, strategy, delivery, you know, operations, financial, all elements of, of delivering that. Uh, but I I look to them to bring technology uh, to the to the strategic table in terms of. Uh, you know the direction, the prioritization uh, for uh, you know for that business area and how it ties into our broader business strategy and, and the underlying uh, technology. So very much more of a uh, a consultative set of skills, strong relationship uh, type skills, uh, but also you know that deep salary to connect into 
the, uh, the the software engineering team, which is where we you know we're really building those strong uh, techno technical skills. Uh, one of the things, so two, two initiatives that we've done to support that. One is we've introduced a competency model. So we, we've uh, you know established uh, you know six competencies uh, that we map each role to, and um, and what that, that's helped us do is basically give a, a basis for career development, skill development, and enables lateral moves more effectively of look at, at you know, how do these competencies map across. Uh, and then we've launched something we call Blue University, which has a very robust uh, uh, you know, learning and development training uh, uh, set of programs that map into those competencies. And we've created a, you know, a, a, a tool for our employees to navigate through those combination of competency and how it's supported with learning development. Because to your point, the reality is you're not going to go, you know, you have fantastic people on the team already. Uh, you need to invest in those to develop them in addition to, you know, to bring in some strength from the outside. So then uh, flipping that over to you, VJ, you know, my uh, firm and my industry would be delighted if all you ever did was recruit your senior leaders from the outside. But that's probably not a wonderful model for you. So um, what are you doing in order to identify the competencies that you need? And, you know, financial services, you got to, you know, I'm not saying it's true of every industry, but financial services, there's a certain culture, there's a certain expectation uh, about business level professional, uh, you know, uh, communication in addition to all those tech skills. So how are you uh, identifying the competencies and developing the pipeline of talent? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, you know, I think our, our journey is very similar to Steve's journey as well, is that, um, you know, I believe in, in leadership that ha is, has ownership of key business areas. So we've organized around the product line uh, type of a model. And, and these leaders on my team, I call them mini CIOs, similar to I think what, what Steve does too, where they have responsibility for strategy, architecture, operations, delivery, um, the whole 360 of, of technology. Um, there is a, an infrastructure organization that, you know, looks at things horizontally um, from data centers and networks and things like that. But in terms of the product and mindset, um, we have leaders that are mini CIOs so that, you know, I can uh, develop leaders in the organization uh, grow them, cultivate them. What I would say, though, about you know uh, leadership is that I've learned over the years that you know there are are good technical people, uh, there are good strategic people, there are good relationship people, and if you look at all these key dimensions, you know nobody's like perfect day one in terms of having it all right. And what I what I think we want to do is identify those leaders that have the potential to grow and the desire to grow in different dimensions and put them into roles that may not be uh, in their comfort zone, but may actually be out of the comfort zone. So for example, we had a woman recently, she is a fantastic program manager, great at relationship management, but did it, hadn't had some of the software engineering delivery experiences, right? It doesn't need to ha be the most technical person as long as she, she has the skill set to work with the team, understand what they're doing, uh, be willing to learn, uh, grow different competencies. And I think she'll be an, a, an extremely talented leader in, in one of those areas and can grow to be a CIO someday if she so desires. Um, and we couple that similar to, to Steve with using um, Degreed uh, as our, um, as our uh, tool to have pathways around um, development and things. But I also think, you know, uh, Martha, that the leadership side of things is incredibly important. And so we have a big um, initiative around empowerment and leadership where we have actually um, cohorts of leaders at different levels that um, have lead empowerment workshops, look across the organization to identify potential uh, impediments that exist across the organization really applied design thinking principles to try to solve those impediments. Um, also, the, the softer side in terms of having critical conversations, um, outward mindset is a big part of our culture here. And we, we actually made outward mindset um, the book of the book of the quarter for the, the entire 
uh, technology organizations. So we spend a lot around developing leaders. And you know, I, I, in terms of the domain knowledge, what I find is that if you get leaders who understand complexity and who have a desire to embrace whatever level of complexity exists in the business, they're able to come up to speed even in, uh, in an industry like financial services. I came from you know, the automotive um, business prior to this from Ford. And although I had experience in financial services very early on in my career, I hadn't done anything in that in 12 or 15 years. And I came into a brokerage business, um, which was totally different. But by looking at information, how information flows from client through system, how it gets processed, where it gets processed, by understanding complexity and flows, you're able to pick up business processes very quickly. I mean, uh, you know, technologists, good technologists are great systems thinkers. And I think having the, the view of an entire system, if you have that, that capability, you can apply it to any business domain very quickly. Thank you. It's a different way to think about talent, right? For years, it's been, what have you done? What have you done? What have you done? And now it's, how do you think and what can you do? And I think, you know, the sooner companies can adopt that as a talent development and talent acquisition philosophy going forward, the closer we're going to get to this customer-centric nirvana. So we have a few minutes left. We have another question. Another question. Uh, Tim, go ahead. Sure. So the topic of IT talent is really resonating uh, with the audience. Uh, one member uh, acknowledges the need for specialized talent, and that is a, probably a hybrid of sorts in terms of technology and, 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 and soft skills, so to speak, but wonders what impact will machine learning, AI, and bots have on the industry, on, have on customer centricity? Uh, will this sort of negate the need for, for people and really require new training? All right. Just a little question for the last five minutes. Impact yeah. of artificial intelligence on our businesses and <laughs> our workforce. Steve, you got uh, 30 seconds. No, I'm joking. What, right. what are your thoughts so, on that? Um, yeah, I, so my, my uh, so two great reads on this, uh, try and be quick. So uh, prediction machines and human plus machine, right? I won't go through this. So mm -hmm. those two books are really strong. The concept of, um, you know, the cheaper prediction is really what AI is all about. And that plugs into um, judgment that is required from the human side. So, you know, more AI actually requires more judgment, but so, i.e. more human. So it's a, this concept of, you know, augmented intelligence or, uh, you know, really understanding and breaking down the anatomy of the work we do and looking at where does that supercharged prediction fit into uh, you know, fit in. I think that there's a uh, a whole bunch of opportunities that are opened up uh, through AI. I'm super excited about the value uh, that it can bring, uh, but the competencies required for doing those new roles are different, right? And we need to to, to realize that, and we're we you know we're baking that into how we're thinking about uh, the competency model. Thank you, VJ. Same question. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And uh, I think what I would summarize is that if you look across the history of time, right, uh, there's been the Industrial Revolution, there, then there was the Internet, and then there was, you know, mobile and web, and all of those were supposed to sort of, you know, make us all more efficient. And here we are with uh, maybe more new and, and complex jobs, right? And uh, in the same way, I think, uh, you know, AI is going to be very supportive of, you um, better bringing co companies closer to their clients. Um, we're doing like recommendation engines and personalization engines. We're offering more self-service. And in the same way that jobs have evolved over time, jobs will evolve so that, you know, the people that are maybe doing some of those manual uh, processes are, are, are likely to do something different in the future. So uh, net, net benefit, I think, AI overall across the industry um, really gets us focused on uh, giving us time to be closer to our clients. I love that. I personally look forward to when the robots just tell me what to do. I really would like them to make my decisions for me. I'm going to ask one more question of each of you uh, and then turn it back to Tim. So there are many people in our audience today who would like to be a part of your leadership team, uh, uh, you know, helping you and the rest of the company to move forward uh, on your customer-centric journey. For these up-and-comers who have a combination of technical skills and soft skills and see themselves as being in your role someday, what advice do you have for them? Steve, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, we should keep it short. I 
I go back to, to being the business. So you have to walk in as a business leader committed to driving outcomes through technology in the context of the, you know, the, 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 the customer experience and outcomes that you, you need to drive. You, you have to have that mindset. The, uh, it's the only way, um, you know, it's fundamental to being successful for the company, not just from an IT perspective. Thank you. Vijay? I would say two things. One is always put yourself out of your comfort zone. So, you know, if you feel like you're in a job and it's getting too comfortable and you want to grow, then that should be the point where you're really looking uh, to take on something brand new so that you're building new muscles, right? It's like any other, um, anything else that you do, building new muscles. The other thing is, you know, I think in, in our role, Steve's role and my role, you know, really seeing a full 360 of technology is so critical, right? And all of us come from a background. So I started off as a software engineer and I would have said, hey, I'm a software guy, right? But throughout our careers, we've been given the opportunity to take on roles in infrastructure or security or strategy or in the business. And for me, I've never said no to a role, even though it might not be my cup of tea because I've always seen it as an opportunity to learn, to say, hey, I get to build a new muscle, I get to see a different side of the business. Even my, the, my worst roles, the ones that were most painful, uh, the death marches have been incredibly, uh, you know, important in terms of leadership development and maybe building your resiliency, you know. So I'm a real big believer that experiences shape great leaders. And so the ones that, you know, swim or sink in my organizations are the ones that have you know, lots of experiences in shaping their careers. Excellent. Thank you so much. I could go on and on about death marches, but we're going to, that'll be a, a topic of a different session. Uh, Tim, uh, please take take us home. I'm taking you home. So it certainly is a fascinating topic, especially as we move from relying on just customer lifetime value metrics into some serious analytics and, and metrics, but we are out of time. So I'd like to thank Martha for moderating the discussion our panelists for taking the time to join us and offer their insights and observations on customer centricity in the enterprise. And of course, our audience for listening in, contributing comments, and hopefully getting some real value from this Power Hour presentation. If you'd like to have more information on the topic, or want to learn more about the CIO Executive Council, its community of IT leaders, its leadership programs and services, as well as the research and intelligence now available to our members through our association with IDC, please reach out to me at tscannel at idc.com, or simply go to our website at cioexecutivecouncil.com. I'm Tim Scannell. See you next time. <laughs>